Great, so for the sake of the recording, now we're beginning, I would just like to introduce myself, obviously, Van Chanda and Ajahn Medito, who's here from Perth via Poland. From Finland. And from Finland. <laughs> so you have two monastics tonight. The Fallhold Assembly is actually present here in our Anukampa Vihara at the moment, Anukampa Grove. So um, I'm looking forward to a lovely discussion. And as many of you will know, last week we started uh, one of the suttas in the Nidana Samyutta. And uh, this is about dependent origination, the heart of the Dhamma, the heart of the teaching. And as I said last week, the Buddha said, one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. One who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma, probably the other way around, but the two equate each other. So um, last week, we didn't get super far, but we did start with the analysis of dependent origination, which is Samyutta Nikaya 12 and uh, Sutta number 2. It's on page 534 of uh, the Samyutta Nikaya by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. And, and just to recap, I wanted to actually start with the very first one, first of all, which goes through dependent origination from start to finish, and I really mean finish. So it goes through the cycle that leads from delusion to suffering and rebirth, and then in the backwards order to the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. So I thought I'd read through that first of all to refresh ourselves and so that anyone listening can, um, can catch up with where we are. And then we'll skip to where we go got to last week in the second sutta, which I think was more or less the part on clinging. And this is where it gets interesting because I think all of us can relate to this and maybe share some of the ways that we notice clinging manifesting in our lives and whether or not that leads to suffering, whether it ever leads to happiness, whether you think it leads to happiness, but then you realize it doesn't or whatever you'd like to share. So, <clears throat> Let's start with the very first one. So this is uh, just called simply dependent origination. Shall I read it? Or yes, I'll yeah? read it. All right. <laughs> Thus have I heard, and this is the voice of the Venerable Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, who is relating what he heard the Buddha say. On one occasion, the Blessed One, that's the Buddha, was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There, the Blessed One addressed the community or the monastics thus, monastics. Venerable sir, those monastics replied. The Blessed One said this. So I'm using the word monastics to include bhikkhus and bhikkhunis because likely there were bhikkhunis, we don't really know, but bhikkhus were usually referred to because they were the senior most community in the fourfold assembly, but for the sake of including everyone, we can also use the word community as well. So community, I will teach you dependent origination. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. Are you listening? Are you ready? <laughs> I'm not the Buddha though, so. <laughs> yes, Venerable Sir, there's People replied, the Blessed One said this, and what, monastics, is dependent origination? So I'm going to change the word ignorance to delusion, as I did last week. With delusion as condition, volitional formations, that's sankaras, come to be. With volitional formations as condition, consciousness, vijnana, with consciousness as condition, name and form. Nama Rupa, with name and form as condition, the six sense bases, Salayatana in Pali. With the six sense bases as condition, contact, Pasa. With contact as condition, feeling, that's Vedana. With feeling as condition, craving, Tanha. With craving as condition, clinging, Upadana. With clinging as condition, existence, that's Bhava. With existence as condition, birth, jati. With birth as condition, aging and death, jara, marana. 
sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. This, monastics, is called dependent origination. And this is nice because we go through the opposite sequence. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of delusion comes cessation of volitional formations. With the cessation of volitional formations, cessation of consciousness, with the cessation of consciousness, cessation of name and form, or Ajahn Brahm's, I think, preferred description, at least, of that is uh, mind and mental content, because form and everything else is, every other mental factor is basically um, what the mind can be aware of. With the cessation of mind and mental contents, let's say, or maybe it's, yeah, mind and mental contents, we can say. We can, we can float that. You can agree or disagree. Cessation of the six sense bases. With the cessation of the six sense bases, cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact, cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of existence. With the cessation of existence, the cessation of birth, and with the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. This is what the Blessed One said. Elated, those monastics delighted in the Blessed one's statement. I'm just checking you out to see if you're delighting or not. <laughs> I first heard this when I was on retreat and I was practicing pretty continuously and for me this was just magic. Even though I couldn't possibly have understood it at any depth, but it somehow made sense or perhaps the delight arose from the idea that there is a cessation of all of this. There's some intuition that only cessation could be the release. So these bhikkhus were elated. It wasn't always the case, but it was usually the case that after the Buddha gave a sermon, they were very um, elated. I like the word elated, actually. It's a really beautiful word. It's a sense of lightness and inspiration is there. So that's dependent origination in its barest bone form. But uh, last week, we actually started the second sutta, which started to define each of these links. And we defined aging and death and also birth as the aging and death and the birth of this physical body into existence, right, into what we call life. And furthermore, we broke it down into existence as three kinds, the sense sphere, the form sphere, and the formless sphere of existence. And we're all now in the sense sphere. That's why we have these senses that can be in contact with their respective objects. And we have the feeling that arises from that and the consequent clinging. <clears throat> so it's, uh, yeah, I think today we can probably look into the next part of this which is the kind of juicy part in the sense that there's not a lot we can do about the previous links because we already have our life. We already have a body that's subject to aging and death. But there is something we can do, at least from the point of noticing that we're clinging, about clinging itself. And at this point, we can weaken the chain, perhaps not break it entirely because it began with delusion and delusion is still running through. But at least at this point, we can start to um, notice where we're clinging and how that clinging leads to suffering immediately. <clears throat> I was just um, preparing some ideas for a retreat I'm teaching on patience. And I was uh, noticing that patience could be thought of as one of the antidotes to craving, to wanting, to clinging. And... I was realizing that, you know, the reason we cling and the reason we don't like to be patient is because we think that wanting or clinging is actually good. We enjoy wanting. Wanting is pleasant to the extent that we want to want. 
we actually want to desire, we want to want, we want to crave, and this is the difficulty here. So to actually start to recognize that rather than bringing us the happiness we hope it will bring us, it actually is not only leading to suffering, but by its very nature, suffering itself, uh, then that clinging starts to loosen. So, so here there are four particular kinds of clinging that the Buddha is referring to, and uh, perhaps we can start to unpick this together a little bit. So I'm starting now on page 535. And uh, I'm not ignoring poor old Ajahn Medito here, but um, he's happy for me to begin this. But I think when we get to the point of discussion or questions or whatever, we'll both uh, contribute uh, whatever we can. So what bhikkhus or monastics is clinging? There are these four kinds of clinging. Clinging to sensual pleasures. Clinging to views, clinging to rules and vows, and clinging to a doctrine of self. This is called clinging. That's tanha, which actually literally means thirst. We're thirsty for these things. And I think we did talk about this a bit last week, but, but um, very interesting looking at it now and wondering where this can go because uh, I guess clinging to sensual pleasures is often where we're most concerned isn't it and even as monastics sometimes that's what we start to notice you know once you renounce some of the material comforts or some of the sensual pleasures and sensuality itself that we've had in the lay life I mean often we've given that up a long time beforehand um, but ironically when we do uh, renounce for many of us you know we find some Anything else to cling to. It might be food, which is also fairly coarse, but it can even be things as seemingly boring and ordinary as like the kind of fabric of our robe or the kind of bowl cover or spoon cover or bowl cover for the bowl cover. <laughs> and things like this, you know, because we want something pretty or you know, pleasant to look at. So this goes very, very deep. And then the clinging to views, I mean, how many arguments come through view or different views? My view is this, your view isn't, I'm not your friend anymore. <laughs> yeah, we all think we have right view. I think it was Ajahn Brown who made that point. Like, you cannot think that you have wrong view because, I mean, your view is what you kind of, I mean, we always think we're right. We wouldn't think something if we didn't think it was right. But perhaps we can start to question it when we see, you know, that we're still suffering in some way. Do we really have right view if it's not a view that leads to freedom and release of suffering? Clinging to rules and vows. So this doesn't mean uh, virtue, but it does mean kind of that observances and virtue by itself can lead to liberation and lead to a doctrine of self, which we might not think we're doing. I mean, I certainly understand intellectually that there's well, I think I do anyway, but to some extent that there's no sort of essence inside. But still, so often we cling to anything that threatens that sense of self, right? We don't want it, we push it away. That's another kind of clinging. So this is called clinging. Should we already pause or shall I just keep going? I feel I'm speaking a lot, so I want to give other people a chance. Mm, that would be. anything so far do you notice any of these clingings in yourself and how do you know they're there how do they manifest yeah so one of our lay guests would like to speak i hope you can hear her so if, if you can you could speak up a bit <laughs> um yeah on the clinging to a doctrine of self clinging to this sense of i am um it can manifest in some very subtle ways and when I started to notice where that is, it really, it's almost surprising. It's like, do I really think that way? And, and it just shows you how deluded, <laughs> how deluded we are. Um, thinking that 
or like not even thinking, but it's just so ingrained um, that we don't. Yeah, even if we understand intellectually yeah. that there is not this essence, um, it still manifests in our behaviors, in our actions, and all sorts of other kind of hidden ways. Yeah, so that's a very sticky one. Yeah, very sticky. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any comment? Did people hear that? Other... Yeah, did people hear? Yeah, you can hear that. Um, Shirley is saying, oh, sorry. I hope you don't mind me mentioning your name, but I'll try not to mention names uh, for the sake of the recording. I'm thinking that there's a sense of contraction when we cling. It's harder to cling when the heart is open. Mm. Good point. Mm. Yeah. We suddenly feel tight. Yeah, I think it's a good point, actually, what, what they made, that the, when you feel relaxed and ease, you know, contentment is very nice automatic antidote to that idea of the, or the, the clinging, you know, when you feel content. that Because otherwise there tends to be a lot of fighting, like you were saying about that, you know, stickiness of self. But if you're not content and happy, the, the tendency is to fight that idea. Mm. But so you, you try to lean towards that kind of contentment and then naturally that clinging, it's not so strong. Yeah. Mm. We always have to keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll come to the two comments here, then I'll come to you. So Benjamin would like to say something. Hello. Um, yes, that, something just occurred to me that I hadn't thought of before on uh, clinging to doctrine of self, which is that it's necessarily just clinging to a doctrine of one's own self, um, but also a doctrine of self in others. And I can think of many occasions when people have referred to something about me from years ago. And I think that wasn't me, <laughs> but they're clinging to that memory as myself mm. i thought that was funny that we can cling to a doctrine of someone else's self as well <laughs> yeah yeah good point yeah it's interesting i mean uh i've seen it the other way around as well like in my own teacher Arjun brown there's something very different obviously in how he relates to himself but there's also some because there's this feeling of freedom there right is uh just completely at peace most of the time i'm not saying he's fully enlightened but there's this sense of complete ease and freedom and not being too concerned about what people think but at the same time i realize that i feel incredibly unjudged and i realize that it's because when you have an insight into non-self for yourself you have an insight into the conditioned nature of everything including everybody else and so He's not judging me either. And I feel very free and at ease because there's no kind of boxing me in in any sense. And I even asked him one year, like I said, oh, you know, how do you think I am this year? Like, I'm better now, aren't I? You know, I'm out of that kind of hole before I was being depressed. Now I'm okay, aren't I? I don't know, he said. And I said, well, but, you know, you can see me now. Like I'm not kind of struggling in the same ways. And can you see this? And can you see that? And he's like, I really don't judge. And what I realized is he really didn't have like this image he was carrying of me along with him. And that was like impressive to me because you wouldn't necessarily think it was a judgment, not in, in the negative way to just recognize whether someone was happier or not. <laughs> but it was the idea that he wasn't carrying that idea along. And so there was this openness for however myself or anyone else would show up. So I think you're right there. Yeah, I think it's understanding the conditioned nature of everything and um, that by itself sort of abolishes that doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to come to Chris. Oh, I shouldn't say names. To another question and then I'll, I'll come to someone in the room. Do you want to do this one? Should I read oh, it? Oh, sorry, you read it because I can't yeah, see it. I'll read it out. My classes. Sure. I'm finding it difficult to distinguish between clinging and craving. So that's Tanha and Upadana. They seem very related and yet different. Ah, great question. Can there be one without the other? Well, that's, that's... Yeah. 
what you want to answer there? Um, well, I can give it a go. <laughs> I think you're totally right in that they're so close. And as far as I've understood from my teachers and perhaps my own experience, although it can seem as though clinging is a milder version, they usually come together. They're, they're kind of almost on top of one another. Mm. Because <clears throat> another translation for craving, is it craving that's talked about here? That actually is the word upadana. So clinging is the word tanha, it's like a thirst. I think it's much better to translate it that way. If you think of clinging like thirst, upadana is like taking something up. It literally means upa, means up, and adana means take. Da dana means give, adana means take, so take up. So it's like thirst is like you want the water, and upadana is like you take it up. You pick it up. So the opposite of craving sometimes it's talked about as attachment sometimes most commonly it's translated as attachment it's not detachment it's putting down which i think is a brilliant translation because this idea of just being aloof or detached to me is something a little bit like bypass something bypassy in that for me a bit cold and sort of i have to be detached um so yeah i think most of the time if there's clinging we take something up we've taken it up mentally at the very least um, and it's not really the object that's as important as the mental taking up. So I think they're pretty much together. And yeah, that you're right that they're it's, a bit different. I mean, it's true that it's a sequence. So it, it mm. goes from that to you literally have to recognize something. You're, it's almost like whether it's actual touching or mental touching that thing. And it, from there, you take it up. If the taking up happens, well, from that taking up, the clinging happens. So you, it comes in a sort of sequence. So you have to remember that there's a mm. sequence. And yeah, exactly. The upadana is, is almost like what the uh, the trees take. You know, mm. the trees, trees take with the root. You take up something. So you take up this thing and it becomes you. When when the tree takes the water, it's inside of the tree, and the the the, the, the clinging almost automatically happens from that. Mm. So the the you have to stop it before it gets there. So don't take it up, and then you don't have it. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting because it is a sequence, and at the same time, some of these links are just coming almost together, mm. and it's almost very very difficult to you know divide the two i think you can only really do that with very strong mindfulness and probably when you can catch it at that point like Bante said catch it at the point of its arising in a sense it's a, yeah. yeah it's almost like don't take it out right yeah, yeah um karen had a question well it's an observation um I like to look at it, child and mother, a baby clings to the mother mm. and gets, it's thirsty, it's, it gets nourishment, but it also craves protection mm. and warmth. Mm. And we can get attached to that then, for example, in relationships or other objects. And then the purpose is that, or the point is that the child becomes independent mm. and is secure in itself, mm -hmm. in the knowledge mother is there when I need her, but I can do this by myself. And that's how, how, how I understand it and remind myself. If, if I attach, I lose that independence or that self-belief that mm. I've got in me so I don't need to mm -hmm. go outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm using the, the term me. But yeah, sure. You have to. Mm. Um, so it's like meant, the baby is meant to mature and to mm. individualize, become independent. Mm. Otherwise, it will continue to cling to yeah. Age 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Mm -hmm. So when I remind myself of that, then it, it, it makes it easier for me. Yeah. 
That's an interesting perception. Mm, yeah. I never heard that before. Because it's we well, I assume we all have had some Mother. parenting or mothering experience. Oh, very interesting, yeah. So mm. I, I sometimes find the theories a bit yeah. a bit clunky when when the feeling is so strong. Yeah. Uh, I, I need to make it very simple and basic. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I thought I just wanted to share that because yeah, in great. English the clinging also means this holding on to physical clinging. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how it works in other languages. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. I'm going to come. There's three more in the box, uh, and then I'll come to you. Oh, you want to just add something to that? And that, that also has um, implications of survival. So, like the self is trying to yeah. survive by clinging. Right, right, That's right. Kind of yeah. yeah, good point. Are you hearing all this okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. it ties into kind Super. of what Bronte was saying about contentment. Like when you're, yeah. like you're saying that the yeah. baby's independent. So, like you were bringing in when you're content, you're not looking outside yeah. to get the thing that you end up clinging to because mm. you're already good. You're good right now. And yeah. I think what you're saying is the baby becomes independent and becomes like a mother, yeah. whoever, maybe both become okay. And then they're not looking for something. And then there's no like, yeah coming out to cling or crave or all those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, maybe it's the same. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is also a good question because this um, addresses our immediate place in the world. <laughs> what about the view of helping others? Can it be seen as a form of clinging to a sense of self through helping others? As I found it helpful to transcend selfish behavior, my selfish behavior in capital. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we have to live in the world. So we use the convention of I and we use the convention of other. We use the, you know, understanding, which is part of our view that there is suffering and that suffering can be, you know, that we need one another, basically. We need one another and kindness and compassion and thinking about others is um, encouraged by the Buddha very, very much. So I don't think that is a sense of clinging. I actually think, like you say, it's a way of uh, transcending selfish behavior. But I guess at a deeper level, when we can actually just give without even thinking of me giving to someone, but we just understand that we're giving, and whether it lands with this person or not, it's a good thing to do, then the behavior becomes even more purely motivated in a sense. Because I guess one of the shadow sides sometimes perhaps of helping is that we sort of, like I've seen, I've lived in India and Asia for most of my adult life. And sometimes when you see new white folks, usually coming for the first time to a country like India, there's this sense of, well, we want to help these poor people, but there's a sense of pity and a sense that, oh, their lives must be absolutely terrible because they're not like ours. And there's definitely a sense of separation there. And it's still maybe, you know, sort of a good motivation, but there's too much sense of self and other there to make it really powerful. And it can actually come across as fairly patronizing sometimes. So, um, yeah, but help people, especially where you... I mean, helping has to be coupled with wisdom, right? So it needs to be applied in a, um, a sensitive way to help people where they actually perhaps need the help or have made it clear how they would like you to help rather than just helping because you feel it's a good thing to do. So, yeah. Shall I read one out for you now? Yep. Yeah. okay. Is it possible to say that clinging is something that you need and instead, craving is something that you want <laughs> based on lust. Based on lust? Yeah. Based on lust. It's possible to say that clinging is something that you need instead of craving is something that you want. Clinging is something that you need. Instead. Wow, why do I get the difficult ones? Instead of craving is something that you want. I look. I think something. Don't get too technical about it. I would say that they is it. Yes, I mean, sure. The last is it's a different one kind of clinging and wanting, but the the or craving. But um, 
is it clinging is something you need no i don't think so i mean the needs uh you, you you know hold on to certain things you know, like you hold on to peace and kindness and those kind of things and uh, the precepts you know not not clingingly but hold on to the good things in life life and you know it's those are sort of wholesome cravings so um I don't know. It's a bit technical in my opinion, that question, but so I don't have anything else to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would just add that both in this case are the cause of suffering. So there's no need there as such. Um, I mean, you could say that the craving, in this case, attachment or whatever you want to call it, the taking up is slightly more solid, slightly stronger, perhaps um but whether it's based on lust i mean it's based on different things right so here we should go into this more it actually says and what monastics is craving there are these six classes of craving craving for forms craving for sounds craving for odors craving for tastes craving for tactile objects craving for mental phenomena this is called craving so they're not necessarily based on lust, if you mean that in a sort of sensual way, but in another sense, they are about the five senses, the six senses, because he's including mental phenomena here. So they're around the senses. But if you go at the, back to the clinging one, it's not only clinging to sensuality, it's also clinging to views, to rules and vows and to adoption of a self. So there are so many ways that we cling. And... Um, I guess the most pervasive ones are the clinging to a doctrine of self and to view, because these are the ones that are, well, I don't know, are they the most pervasive? Actually, these are the ones that are rectified with stream winning. And the sensuality is not all gone at that point. So, but these are the ones we need to work on to actually um, see the Dhamma. Yeah. Um, I think, okay, I'll unmute you. You can go for this as well. Oh, sorry, am I reading something? Um, no, you don't have to because this person is going to unmute. Oh, right. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've some, got something in the chat as well. But I wanted to go back to uh, what I think it was Richard was saying about. Was it Richard? I'll have to scroll up a bit. Helping. Richard said about. Um, generosity and it's just it was just a little reflection because the buddha did encourage us to reflect on our own generosity and it can actually bring a sense of joy when you reflect on your generosity and virtue and that's actually one of the i think the six contemplations which can um, be very useful but and we we find it very difficult but also we can really strongly identify with being a good person or a nice person or a generous person. And I just wanted to share a little experience I had the other day when I thought I'd upset somebody. It was a bit of a discombobulating situation where somebody had got upset and I'm not quite sure why. None of us were quite sure why. And I thought, well, it was me. I said something. I upset them. It was somebody I didn't take to at all. And I felt bad about that. So I was just sitting with this sort of feeling of, oh, you know, and what's it all about? And I realised a lot of it wasn't so much distress that I'd upset somebody, but I wanted to be the good girl, you know, I wanted. And it was about ego. And I just thought that was quite, quite interesting, this sort of wish to be perceived as the... And I find that very powerful this sort of feeling and it's 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 just good to you know it's just interesting to notice that in myself i just wanted to share that because it's so um yeah to 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 sort of um yeah we can reflect on our goodness but also we can then sort of attach to this wish to be a a good person rather than a good nurse so i just thought i'd share that thanks Um, absolutely. Uh, the um, Jaganusati, which you mentioned is exactly, it's absolutely, I think we don't do enough of the reflection of the, of the, the, the that kind of goodness and the giving we do. I, I think we should do more of it than the, 
all the all all the other anusatis. It's very important. But once once in a while, I like to also remind people that um, when I um, teach metta, for example, that look um, have a money in a bank first before you start giving it out, because otherwise you go into debt. So um, keep keep doing it. But remember always, you have to have a lot of metta or compassion towards yourself. And it really, once you have the money in the bank, then you can start giving, otherwise you go into debt. So, and once you start, really start giving, obviously it grows as well, but if you don't have to, compassion towards yourself, it's it sort of, you're coming from a wrong place. And it, so that's why help help yourself first in many, many cases, you know, it's a, it's a good thing as well mm. to keep in mind. Mm. Mm. So we have to be realistic about these things. <laughs> Uh, there is another question that was there a while. If one is aware that one is wanting, maybe clinging is less powerful. Maybe we can loosen the chain there. So, yeah, I would totally agree. Um, I think that's what I was referring to before when I said that this is a place we can weaken the chain um, if we are aware, because I think what we're usually aware of, if we're really aware, is that the clinging is suffering. And the mind has enough wisdom, especially as we train it, and especially as we develop, like Vante said, compassion, self-compassion, to automatically start letting go of things that cause suffering. It's the delusion that the clinging is happiness that's the problem. But the more we're aware of the effect of clinging, like you said, um, that it can be a state of contraction rather than a state of relaxation or contentment or spaciousness, then um, the easier it is to, to stop it right there. Yeah, but this, this, this takes practice, you know, and you have to keep on practicing the eightfold path. Mm. Yeah. You. Was the one here? You. Oh, you. I was just gonna say that, speaking of clinging and craving, that we started this whole session talking about the weather and how we liked, we liked, you know, it was a nice day. So it's like we, we craved that, or we, we were clinging to like the nice day. Like if it was a bad day. We'd be like, it was rainy and we don't like it. Like we're not, like you were saying, content with where we are. So we're looking for something to change all the time. Yeah. This is the, this is the constant. I think there's a song about that constant craving or something. Oh, uh, who the was? What, I think mm. there is a Petty Lang, yeah. But it's like you're constantly trying to <laughs> shift out of being uncomfortable. Mm. And this yeah. is where the craving comes mm. from, right? Like yeah. you're all the levels of it all the time. Sure. Mm. sure. But I think the I'm sorry, the, 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 the I think the contentment grows really nicely that you can be content with anything. Mm. Yeah. So the the level of the contentment grows. So Mm. It's easy to be content when the sun is shining, you slept well, and you yeah. have a belly full. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. it's easy, you know, it's easy to be content. So it's like, yeah. But I mean, look, you have to start somewhere. So at least you've noticed the contentment in those mornings. That's but, right. So but the contentment, look, you can be you don't have even if your mind is sick, your or body is sick, your mind doesn't have to be sick. That's yeah. right. So Start developing it, you know, it's having definitely. the perception, yeah, contentment. He's like, I can be content with this. Mm. Yeah. So, but yeah. learn it somewhere. Learn mm. it's like, oh, mm. this is what contentment feels. Mm. Like, then the bad times come, they will come. Well, then, yeah, I can try to be a bit more content. Mm. Yeah. In England, we have to start to learn not to complain about the weather. That would be a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to carry on, actually, because uh, I just decided to carry on before I got another hand raise. <laughs> Um, so if you don't mind waiting for the next little part, because it'd be nice to get to the contact piece. And I am kind of keen to at least read through this once before we um, part today so that you have something to um, continue to contemplate over the next weeks and months. But again, you'll be having sessions. We'll be doing Sunday evenings for the next uh, several months. Um, so I'd like to go to the next link, which is uh from craving to feeling so what monastics is feeling so this is remember defining each of the links there are these six classes of feeling that's vedana feeling 
Feeling born of eye contact. Feeling born of ear contact. Feeling born of nose contact. Feeling born of tongue contact. Feeling born of body contact. And feeling born of mind contact. This is called feeling. So they're all distinct, I think is the point here, and they all happen due to contact at different sense doors. So when the eye comes in contact with forms, there's a feeling there of pleasure, pain, let's say something pleasant, something that we don't like, something disagreeable and something in between. Hmm? And the next one, and what monastics is contact? There are these six classes of contact. Eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, and mind contact. So we're going back in the sequence. Before you can have feeling arising from contact, there has to be contact. And what monastics are the six sense bases? <clears throat> so these can be thought of as the actual um, organs but the whole kind of neural network around those organs so the whole kind of um aspect of <coughs> the visual apparatus let's say would be the eye so it's not just the eyeball but it's the kind of i don't know what the nerves are called visual nerve called something like that something like that huh optical nerve optical nerve, optical nerve etc so what because or monastics are the six sense bases <clears throat> the eye base the ear base the nose base the tongue base the body base and the mind base these are called the six sense bases we all have those it's again something so universal like you're blind or yeah that's right actually you can be blind but you have enough of these to have a lot of contact that can lead to clinging. <laughs> so, you know, even if you're missing one, there'll still be clinging arriving, arising at the others. And what monastics is this so-called name and form? So this is why it can be also called mind and mental content. So it's feeling, these are aspects of the mind, first of all, feeling, perception, volition, contact and attention this is called name the four great elements and the four and the form derived from the four great elements this is called form so it's breaking this body and everything else in the world that's material down into these elements thus this name and form are together called name and form So in a way, it's talking about the body broken down into the four elements and then these other aspects of the mind, which are very, very similar to the khandas, actually. So feeling is vedana, perception is sanya, volition is, I think in this case, chaitana, but it's so similar to sankara. Contact is the contact, again, that we were talking about in the last one, and attention is a form of using the mind it's i mean this is the bit that i'm not really clear on the difference between say vinyana and attention and attention is kind of i guess the way that the consciousness is used to attend um it kind of presupposes that consciousness is present because consciousness came earlier on in the chain so it's talking about the mind in a slightly different way but it's basically including all of these five khandas the body, the perception, the volitional reactions or formations, the um, consciousness, and what's the other one? Perception, uh, feeling, and feeling as well. And then we're breaking down consciousness. This is interesting because this is where the delusion of a self as being existing in the mind gets broken down. Because consciousness is not only mind consciousness. So what monastics is consciousness? There are these six classes or types of consciousness. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, 
tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. This is called consciousness. And Ajahn Brahm started to translate that as consciousnesses to make the point that it's plural. Should I keep reading or should I keep reading to the end for the flow and then we talk about it? Yeah. And what monastics are the volitional formations? So this is Sankara. There are these three kinds of volitional formations. The bodily volitional formation, the verbal volitional formation, and the mental volitional formation. These are called volitional formations. Now we're getting to the beginning. And what, monastics, is delusion? So here's the definition. Not knowing suffering. I really wonder if that should be not understanding suffering. I prefer that anyway. Not knowing the origin of suffering. Not knowing or understanding the cessation of suffering and not knowing the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called delusion. And actually I'd go one deeper and say not experiencing might be even better, at least in the sense of the last few, because you have to actually really understand as in really, at least when it comes to the cessation, actually experience it. So now we're going through the whole thing again in the forward sequence, thus, as a kind of summary. Thus, monastics, with delusion as condition, volitional formations come to be. With volitional formations as condition, consciousness. With consciousness, name and form, with name and form, the sixth sense basis. With sixth sense basis, contact. With contact, feeling. With feeling, craving. With craving, clinging with clinging existence, with existence, uh, birth, with birth, aging and death. And with aging and death, this whole mass of suffering in brief. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of delusion comes cessation of volitional formations. With the cessation of volitional formations, cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of um, volitional formations. Right? No, volitional formations, consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, the cessation of name and form. With the cessation of name and form, the cessation of the six sense bases, the cessation of contact, cessation of feeling, born of that contact, cessation of craving, cessation of clinging, cessation of existence, cessation of birth. With no birth, the cessation of aging and death. With the cessation of aging and death, the cessation of Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, or displeasure and despair. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Okay. This is the full Dhamma here. <laughs> and I'm coming to Liz because she had her hand up earlier. So... Here we go, and then I'll come to the question in the chat. Okay, yeah. Oops, sorry. Can you unmute? Yes. Shall I close the... Here we go. I will be just very quick, but what Dante said about contentment. Contentment is my barometer. And when the contentment goes down, I think, okay, stop there, why? And uh, even with this sciatica, it's very, very painful. You can be content. You think, oh, the earth element is having a fit here. Right. Uh, 
I can do something else or I can accept it. I mean, that's the first thing, not be discontented. It's normal to have sciatica when you uh, use your back quite a lot in your life. Of course, you will have this kind of problem. Okay, well, instead of climbing the ladder to do this and that, I will do something else. Uh, and still have a smile in your mind not necessarily when you walk, but <laughs> you manage. I, I think contentment is such an important thing. It, it's not very talked about, but I'm quite a contented woman. When I'm not, I think, ah, hang on, there is something going on, you know, and uh, yeah. Yeah. it's very, very useful. <laughs> That's it, I... Uh, Nothing else to say. <laughs> that's that's nice, very um, encouraging, and it's nice that you talk about the parameter. It's like you you have a like thing on your mind. It's like I'm going into less and less content. It's like okay, well, change your direction and see if the, mm. it goes up the meter. Mm, very mm. Nice. And like you said as well, like when I'm not content, something's going wrong. It's like. Mm. You can actually direct that straight to wanting because you can be sure that when there's discontent, you're wanting. It's the same thing, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So I got the difficult question this time, unless you want to do it. No, no, no. no. <laughs> that wasn't a question, though. Okay. <laughs> well, it's up to let's, you. let's answer it together. Yeah, we can answer it together. Could you please explain what volitional formations or sankharas are? I always get confused by this. Yeah, it's um, what well, Ajahn Brahm likes to translate it as a, a will, really. It, it, it is a bit fancy to say volitional formations. You don't really, we don't use this kind of word really in day to day language. It's like, my volitional formation wants me to drink <laughs> some water. No, I, you know, it's you really think it as like your will. And this is how likes to translate it as uh, choices. So we, we have these choices in life and you, we, the self comes from really, uh, really from there. So Ajahn Brahma always says that if anywhere where the self lives is in your will, and we have this idea it's, that it's my will, I'm making choices. That's why Pandasada calls it choices, because everything you choose, every time you choose something, good or bad it's you where you live so but for really for you to see you know you really have to get into the deep meditation to see when the when the sankara the volition the the will choices have disappeared then you really understand what it is until then you like a like a like a frog in the water a fish in the water you don't know what water is until you're outside of the water so think it as like a will you're choosing or, or, or in this kind of thing and you really just think as like that's really who i am i'm you you're choosing all the time so that's where you live so just think about choices or will those are two things and mm. easy for you to remember mm. yeah yeah that's good i mean i think there is a slightly wider meaning in terms of uh like Ajahn Brahm actually used to say, he used to be a little bit broader than that and say it's not just the will, but it's the willed as well. There are things formed from that will. So there's like, you could even say a mountain is a sankara. It's been created, it's been made, it's been fabricated. Um, but yeah, it's basically a heap of kama, <laughs> a heap of reactivity quite often. Um, and it's the sort of active part of the mind. It's the doer. Mm. That's another way Ajahn Brahm likes to call it is the doer. So it's that imp inside that likes to get involved and kind of um, shift things around or push yourself a bit faster or kind of want the breath to get softer or want the bliss to arise or whatever. It's that sort of um, this sense of an agent and the sense that, like Banta said, you've got some kind of free will, you've got some kind of choice. Um, I mean, it is there, it's not a phantom, but it's completely conditioned. So in that sense, we're much more out of control than we'd like to believe. So, yeah, I think of it as well as the doer. And that's one of the main parts of the sense of self. And the other part is this identification with us being the knower, the one who knows. Mm, consciousness, in other words. These are the places we tend to identify the most. It was me that chose that. I decided. <laughs> yeah. 
I think in my previous meditation, especially in the Goenka tradition, I thought of it more as a, a reactivity, which then, you know, it's also a doing, right? It's a sort of uh, reacting. And here in the dependent origination, it's talking about three kinds. So the bodily, the verbal, or the mental. So we can do this with our body, speech, or mind. Hmm. It is more than reactivity, but it is a kind of action. That's the thing. Yeah. And there's a lovely talk last night that we listened to where he was saying that um, once we can start to still this doer, the sankhara, there's less and less to be conscious of. So consciousness starts to fade. It was a nice way to look into this sequence, you know, how it works in the opposite direction, that when we stop kind of producing, creating, fabricating, reacting, wanting, willing, then consciousness, like everything starts to still, become still, and we're aware of less and less and less. Yeah. I hope that makes a bit of sense. I probably complicated what you said. Mm, that's what I'm thinking. It gets, you can give a whole talk about this. but mm, It's a huge talk. I mean, it's also something we have to understand through experience, right? We have to see where we're doing the sankara ing, see where we're actually creating karma. It's basically the same as uh, karma being created. So we can create, I mean, in the beginning, we can't not create anything. So we try to create good karma. It is an interesting topic. Sometimes we sort of argue with other amongst the monastics. Did the Buddha have, you know, did he have a will? And <laughs> like, where where does it end? How far does it go? Like even Buddha, he said that when he goes back to home, towards where he's from, he he liked the food there, that direction. That. So. Mm, yeah. Uh, Richard had his hand up. We'll take this one last comment now because we're nearly out of time. So we we'll just come to you, Richard, to. Uh... Wind up the day. Um, yes, hi, I'm um, yes, Venables. And that's what I was trying to say, you know, in my, in my question. It actually occurred to me as you were explaining about volitional action and the doer. That's what I was actually trying. I mean, I wasn't really conscious you know, of my question. But as you were explaining about volitional action, the doer, you know, that's what I was actually unconsciously trying to explain. Because, like, I'm trying to help people, but I was actually becoming more aware that sometimes I'm doing it out of will. It's become more like a an action of doing it, more than actually helping. You know, I become so conditioned to helping people that it's actually now become an act of will as well. So now it's become selfish, as well as helping people and being helping myself. You know, so I notice in myself that it's actually now become, you know, and obviously other people as well, besides myself. But a lot of people do help for things because it's um, because it's like an act of will. You know, the the trained become nurses or nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's nice to be nice. But that but that could be put down as a the violation, it's a viol not violation, as the volitional action, as an act of will. So that's what I think I was trying to say unconsciously until you explained it. So that's basically, that was my question when I wrote it down, but I didn't really understand consciously. And now you explained it. So that's my, that was actually my original question. Thank you. Anything else? No, I'm fine. Okay. Okay, well, we're coming close to the end and uh, we have actually finished that sutta. So um, I don't know, my idea, I suppose, next year, probably, or towards the end of this year, <laughs> is we could, mm, well, we'll see what we choose to do, but we could, it'd be really nice, actually, to go into the Upanishad Sutta after this, which you probably heard me teach so many times, but it's another version of um, dependent origination. It's just that it's the opposite instead of like the version of cessation going back through the links it actually goes from suffering into um what some people call dependent liberation or transcendental dependent origination um i think it was actually Bhikkhu Bodhi who came up with this but Ajahn Ramali loves that topic and i teach it a lot as well 
Uh, we can look at how um, we can actually cultivate some of those qualities we were talking about, the contentment, the joy, the, the, the wholesome volition, if you like, and increasingly less volition as the sequence progresses. So we could perhaps do that another time. But anyway, there'll be lots of teachings before then. I'll tell you something about that in a bit. But I think um, yeah, Minori will probably say a few words and then I'll let you know what's coming soon. Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for Venerable Chanda and Ajahn Mudita both for these rich, rich teachings and also to give us an opportunity to discuss, not just listening to a Dhamma talk, but to discuss and um, answer, our, you know, get our questions um, answered and then understand the teachings deep, deeper. So, as you all know, today's discussion was offered as usual on the donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And with your generosity, what we do, um, the Anukampa Bikuni project and Venerable Shanda and the whole of the community uh, uh, can, can improve and um, uh, the Venerable and the Anukampa Bikuni can provide the community with wide and wide world valuable Dhamma talks, teachings and meditation retreats. And as you know, most of these things are there online, uh, free for you in the YouTube. Uh, and there's links in our Facebook and uh, in the website. So as you know, Anukampa Bikuni project is a UK charity and the Anukampa Grow Monastery in Oxford gives more space for the monastics, opportunities for the women to ordain and lay people to visit, etc. You'd have heard that there's other people sitting in front of Venerable all these days, and uh, and many people are coming to the monastery now. Uh, that it, now it has space, so your donations are very valuable in maintaining the monastery as well. And um, of course, there's a high upkeep and maintenance cost and also it costs to change a house to a workable monastery so we're still doing that and we'll be doing that for some time so i invite you to support anukampa if you are able whatever the way you you know can donate what we need these days is mostly the financial support and if you can do standing orders that's great as well that makes us um easy to manage the things. I will put the link if you need it. There you are. And if you want to, if you are prone to get in, you know, involved in different ways, there is team at Anukampa project or talk. Uh, of course, Venerable told that she is going for Vasa in a few days' time, maybe a few couple of weeks' time. So there won't be any dana needs, you know, after that. But then there's so many other things that you can get involved. So, and you may be having special um, uh, strengths that you can volunteer. So please contact team at anukampaproject.org. And uh, contact, connect to with our website. And there's, there's places in the website for the needed items and uh, they're in the Facebook, it updates and tell what's happening. And the best way is to uh, subscribe to the newsletter and uh, you will get all these changes regularly to your email. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Manoi. I'm just putting one more link in, which is about our events. Uh, because as Manoi just said, I will be away for a few months to deepen my practice and take some much needed rest. I have a few health issues that I need to uh, sort out and actually it's going to be easier to do that in Perth, I think, but um, a lot of it is just the rest and rejuvenation and a bit opportunity to, to go deeper in the practice. And uh, also to give us a chance to do some renovations on the monastery. So we're going to have the roof cleaned. We're going to have like, well, we were going to have like a whole irrigation system put in. It looks a bit complicated. So <laughs> we're just using hoses instead. But there's more plumbing works and, you know, there's kind of the ongoing maintenance. We've got quite a few people coming to take care of the plants and to stay for a little periods of time so the place will be really well protected and looked after so I'm not worried at all 
And I'm very grateful to everyone who's enabling me to have this time so that when I do come back, I can open the doors to anyone or let's say those people who are already keen on exploring ordination possibilities. So we'll see what comes. It won't be quick. It will be, it takes time to grow bikinis. It takes many, many years sometimes before people are really ready to take the first step. But this is what we're here for. And almost at least every couple of days, there are people saying how much it means to know those opportunities and that it's something they didn't think could be possible until they found us here in the UK, especially women in the UK who haven't heard or haven't had this opportunity before. So uh, very, very grateful for your support. And yes, we won't really be doing uh, food dana anymore. I think we've got enough now for the last few weeks that I'm here. And uh, what's the other thing? Yes, the guest applications will be halting for a while. We've already got like sometimes three or four guests booked in for next year at a time. So in other words, we're full for long periods at a time already. Um, so we're halting those applications until say November. So if you do want to consider coming to stay, please send them then and I'll, I'll reply at some point then. And in the meantime, we have weekly programs. It will be usually 7.30 p.m. on a Sunday, but quite often at 9 a.m. because of the time zones that various bikinis are in. So there aren't that many bikinis in the world, but I've got at least eight or nine of them teaching for us. So it's amazing, really. Plus Ajahn Brahmali is giving a couple of talks, plus Ajahn Nito as well. Uh, so a really rich summer program. And I'm also teaching at Gaia House next week on the theme of patience. So that will be hopefully interesting and we'll have talks to upload so there'll be tons and tons of dhamma to keep you nourished i hope uh, and uh, i am also hoping but i can't promise to do some kind of evening session before i go probably not on a friday or not on a weekend because i'm away for the next two weekends but uh possibly on the very last week that i'm here just because i'd like to see you and be able to um and be able to say goodbye and maybe share a little bit more together. So keep an eye out and it will be in the newsletter if it's possible. Otherwise, it will be on the Facebook page. OK, so I guess we say goodbye. Uh, Matthias just mentioned one of the links was wrong. Yeah, it was mine. <laughs> anyway, I think, you know, our website by now and he's put the correct uh, address in for the events. Yeah, actually, we're going to be registering for a couple of Bhante Sajato events. He's going to come to England and we're going to do a talk and uh, a few talks, actually. Only one's organised by us, but we're organising a couple of day retreats, one in Oxford and one at the monastery, half a day at the monastery. So it'll be actually Saturday and Sunday. But there's only a few places for the monastery one. So I'm not going to reply. I'm going to collect everybody's application and then kind of work out who's coming from overseas. And anyway, I'm going to have to work it out a bit according to space but um hopefully we'll put that up for registration in the next couple of weeks all right take care goodbye look after yourselves Ooh. how do you say Ooh. Ooh. it's Ooh. some sort of aussie thing <laughs>